Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, also with Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. Um, so continuing on um, looking at methane in the Arctic, methane in the seafloor sediments and how much can make it up into the atmosphere and how much will um, as we lose sea ice and snow cover in the Arctic and get much warmer ocean water. So what I was pointing out is that if you have very tiny bubbles, three millimeters, they don't, they don't rise up through the water column. They dissolve into the water column, bigger bubbles, make it up a couple hundred meters. So if the water's deep, they, the, um, the seeps of methane, this is a gas hydrate stability zone, they won't make it up to the surface. If the seeps are um, at lower depths, then a fraction of the methane will make it to the surface. Most of the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf and other, other continental shelves in the Arctic are very shallow. And so this is the case where lots of the methane bubble gets up to the surface. And I can go up here and just show you uh, quickly the image of, just to remind you of what the Arctic uh, geography is like. These are the deeper regions. These are all shallow continental shells. Um, and mostly average depth here is about 45 meters. It's the largest shallow sea, if you like, on the, on the planet. So those, from, from those regions, methane coming up will mostly go into the atmosphere, which of course is a big problem. Okay, so moving on, the processes affecting methane distribution in the water column in the Arctic Ocean. There's three main mechanisms that transfer methane from the sediment to the water column. One is the release of dissolved methane by diffusion or advection, which is current water current flow. Two is the release of gas bubbles from the sediments. And three, the rise of consolidated methane hydrate. So if the methane hydrate is broke, detaches from the sediment and then it's buoyant and then it just rises up, and then through the water column, and some of it can actually reach the surface. It depends if there's a lot of it. Remember, if there's, if there's an underwater landslide triggered by an earthquake on a fault region or something, then you could have large amounts of this clathrate, um, the frozen form reaching the surface, um, rising quickly through the water column. If it's not that deep, reaching the surface, and all, then all that methane would go into the atmosphere. So. Where the methane flux, if the, if the methane flow from the, from the um, seafloor is large enough, methane can just escape as bubbles that rise individually or in a plume. And I talked about the large bubbles can reach the surface, the smaller bubbles get mostly dissolved. So even, so, and, and it's about 200 meters for the large bubbles. So methane is unlikely to be emitted directly into the atmosphere. It would get dissolved in the water column. And if it's under the pycnocline, which is where the separation between the cold, fresher water on the surface and the warmer, saltier water of higher density below, that can act as a barrier. But if, that, but if there's a lot of wave action, mixing and um, and currents and so on, then, then you know, less sea ice, big storms and stuff, then, th then that can go up into the, uh, you know, surface water and then get into the, um, into the atmosphere. Okay, so let's see what else we can talk about. So the, the effect of the ice, of course, is um, very large um, because that will also, you know, the ice itself can trap the bubbles of, of methane underneath it. And then if you get the um, bacteria in that region building up, then that can break down the methane during the time that it's trapped under the, under the ice. Um, this is talking about the pycnocline in the Arctic. It's it's mostly um, between 50 and 250 meters. So most of the Arctic Ocean is permanently stratified 
with warmer but more salty water from the Atlantic and Pacific underlying a surface layer that's colder and fresher. And that's derived from the ice melting, which is fresh water for the most part, or the salt content is lower. If it's, you know, first year ice, second year ice, it'll be, you know, half or a third what the open ocean is in terms of salt content. Also fresh water from river runoff. Um, and so that will stratify the Arctic. And this is a barrier to transport. So methane underneath that barrier would be transported horizontally or laterally by currents until storms deepen the mixed layer. Um, and basically, um, then it could be released to the water above. So there's lots of these processes going on. And what else can we say? So as the sea ice cover decreases, sea surface temperature increases, evaporation increases, precipitation increases, that makes the surface water even fresher. Um, the discharge of river water into the Arctic is also greatly increasing due to uh, warmer continents, you know, causing much more melting, and that makes it stratified as well. And that can, um, so there's all of these different effects going on, but we're definitely seeing um, as we get less and less sea ice, we're getting more and more methane coming up. And we definitely can see that happening. And basically, there is lots of oxygen um, in, the, um, Ar in the Arctic Ocean and shelf seas. So these are sheets, uh, the, the water over the continental shelf, well oxidized. So methane that escapes from the sea, the, the sea floor and in, is in this water column, escapes the AOM filter in the sediment and is in the water column. It can still be oxidized um, if it's in aqueous state, uh, but if it's in bubble state, but that takes some time. So um, this is the methane concentration um, in the water column, and this is the turnover time. So this is a time from when the methane is formed and first appears in the water column to when it is removed via, say, um, aerobic oxidation processes. So there's a large variation here. This process can take very long. Uh, as the concentrations get higher and higher, it shortens up, but the mixing and things like that that are occurring in the Arctic greatly reduce these, uh, the, these lifetimes. So, but you know, there's still so much that we don't know about these processes, but the, one of the key points is that the, that the idea that meth methane coming up from the sediments in the Arctic, methane uh, coming up that's in the water column that then comes into the atmosphere. This is, this is ignored by the IPCC. Um, it's considered not to, be, uh, not to be a significant factor for climate change. And obviously this is not the case. Uh, you know, it's coming up in larger and larger quantities and we need to find out how much that will affect the climate. Once you have methane in the water column, um, it still has to get through to the air, so it can diffuse through. Um, if there's turbulence and if there's wave action, if there's winds over the surface, then this greatly increases the gas exchange from the, from the, from the liquid to the atmosphere. So um, this is also being studied more and more. Larger waves and swells will be more common. There's more evaporation of water into the atmosphere. So this, not only do the larger swells break up the sea ice and vertically mix the surface waters more, but they also will allow more methane to come out of the water column. And many models are predicting stronger winds and storm tracks that migrate closer to the pole as the Arctic continues to warm. These strong polar lows can really stir up the water, create large um, meridional wind speeds and so on. So there's lots of other things that are happening. So um, in summary, um, the atmospheric methane concentrations have changed significantly in the past. It's widely accepted that this is uh, occurring in conjunction with global climate shifts. Um, Arctic methane emissions played a major role, um, may have, I mean, it's almost certain they played a major role in the past. 
and will play a large role in the future as well, well, in the present and in the future. So, um, so let's sort of summarize this. Um, there obviously needs to be a lot, of, a lot more study about these things. Um, here's where we go. With the exception of CO2, um, the, dis the, the biogeochemical transformations of physical processes that affect the distribution of climate active gases, so methane, nitrous oxide, etc., are poorly represented in Earth system models. The, the role of the seabed processes is not considered at all. So the methane hydrate, the methane coming up into the water column, etc. These things need to be understood in terms of the anaerobic and aerobic oxidation, bubble transport, the effects of ice cover, and the modeling community tends to ignore a lot of the observations we're seeing, and they need to you know, because it's a lot of work to change the models and incorporate these factors, but it, it has to be done. It's, it's vital to understand um, how much methane will actually come up as we lose Arctic sea ice. And since we're likely to lose Arctic sea ice within a few years, probably before 2020, have an open Arctic Ocean for the month of September, then within a few years, open for August, September, October, within a few more years, attack on an additional month of openness on either side, and we're heading, you know, within a decade, possibly no sea ice in the Arctic at all, no snow cover, much warmer region. We have to get a handle on how much methane will come up. The spread of methane in the Arctic is just, uh, is, is unacceptable. I mean, Look, let me, I'm just going up here to this curve. I mean, look at the inventory of methane hydrate. Look at the range here, 30 to 9,000, submerged permafrost. You know, are we gonna hope that it's at these low values and just proceed? Or, you know, we need to narrow down these values. This is narrowed down a lot more. These are likely, these are obviously nowhere near the lower end. You know, are they near the higher end? I mean, these are lots of questions that we have to answer because the fate of of humanity on this planet depends on the answer to these questions. So please, um, I do lots of videos. Please have a look at my website, paulbeckwith.net, uh, where there's often posts about these. Go to um, YouTube, Paul, Google, you, within YouTube, um, search for Paul Beckwith. You'll find my videos and I post lots of videos to try to educate the public on the grave uh, risks that we face from climate change and also for evidence as to why um, it's an emergency uh, situation. Here we go, it's, it's an emergency, so we need the flashing red light again. Um, and we need to slash fossil fuel emissions, we need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and we need to cool the Arctic, and we need to have a handle on methane. How big a problem is it going to be? And it will dictate the I, I think it, we're going to find, I know the answer, I think it's a huge problem. This is why we have to cool the Arctic. Um, and uh, anyway, thank you. So have a look at my website, paulbeckwith.net. And please consider uh, a financial donation to support my videos, which I do on my own time. And I'm not being paid to do them uh, apart from uh, your, your donations, your help. So thank you very much for uh, listening and paying attention to climate change.